Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the introduction. And I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak today about obesity hypoventilation syndrome, sleep hypoventilation, and respiratory failure. I have received research grants from the Ontario Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care and Merck Incorporated. However, these are not relevant to my talk today. The objectives of my talk today are to describe the features of obesity hypoventilation syndrome, to discuss the perioperative risks of OHS, to describe how to screen for OHS, and then to discuss how a perioperative risk management plan can be utilized to reduce risks in patients with OHS. Obesity hypoventilation consists of a triad of obesity, so a BMI greater than or equal to 30, sleep disordered breathing, and in 90% of cases, the sleep disorder breathing is obstructive sleep apnea. However, in 10% of cases, the sleep disorder breathing is non-obstructive sleep hypoventilation. And the distinguishing feature between OSA versus obesity hypoventilation syndrome is the presence of daytime hypercapnia defined as an arterial PCO2 greater than or equal to 45 millimeters of mercury. And other causes for hypercapnia should be excluded, such as neuromuscular, respiratory, or metabolic disorders. Sleep hypoventilation has been described as hypoxemia occurring during sleep, mostly during REM sleep that is not present during wakefulness. And this is confirmed by monitoring the PCO2 during sleep, and this is usually done with transcutaneous PCO2 monitoring during a polysomnography. Sleep hypoventilation has been attributed to OHS, uh, medications that impair ventilatory drive such as opioids and underlying pulmonary or neuromuscular disorders. Obesity hypoventilation was first described in 1955 in a case report by Aachen Kloss et al. And they described a young man who presented with dyspnea, ankle edema, cyanosis, obesity, and hypersomnolence, which are common features in patients with OHS. He had right ventricular hypertrophy, pulmonary hypertension, and, and polycythemia. He was found to have alveolar hypoventilation, as evidenced by hypoxia, hypercarbia, and did not have any lung or chest wall or CNS pathology to explain these findings. The prevalence of OHS has been estimated to be about 0.4 to 0.6 in the general population adult population. However, the prevalence does increase with increasing BMI as well as increasing severity of, o of OSA. And in sleep clinics, the prevalence is estimated to be between 10 to 20 percent of obese patients with OSA who are seen in sleep clinics. In the bariatric surgical population, it's estimated that about 8 percent of these patients also have OHS. OHS is associated with significant comorbidities. In this study, they compared patients with OHS versus obese controls, and they found that patients with obesity hypoventilation syndrome had a ninefold increased risk for congestive heart failure, angina, and core pulmonale. As well, when compared to patients with OSA, patients with OHS are at increased risk for mortality. And in fact, over five, the, over five years, the odds ratio of death was two times higher in patients with OHS compared to patients with OSA. As well, the risk for cardiovascular events was almost two times higher. And importantly, non-compliance with not with um, non-invasive ventilation was found to be an independent predictor of mortality in patients with OHS. So the mainstay of treatment of OHS remains positive airway pressure therapy. And so CPAP is the first line of treatment, and this has been shown to improve hypoxemia and hypercapnia after two to six weeks of initiation. And when CPAP um, is uh, unsuccessful in relieving persistent hypoxemia, non-invasive ventilation is recommended in the form of either bilevel PAP therapy or uh, ASV. 
So uh, Rube Kaw in uh, 2016 published this paper comparing patients with hypercapnic OSA to patients who had OSA but did not have hypercapnia. And so in the hypercapnic group, this included patients with either definite or possible OHS and overlap syndrome. And he found that patients who had hypercapnic OSA had significantly increased risk for respiratory failure, heart failure, tracheostomy, and need for ICU transfer. This is a screening algorithm for patients with suspected OHS. And so if uh, a prior sleep study result should be obtained if possible, if it has not been done, then a screening questionnaire such as the stop bang questionnaire should be performed and a PSG should be obtained when possible. A serum bicarbonate should be obtained in these patients who are suspected to have OHS. And if the serum bicarbonate is less than or equal to 27, this means that OHS is very unlikely. However, if the serum bicarbonate is greater than 27, this suggests the patient probably has OHS. And if the serum bicarbonate is greater than 27, or if the oxygen saturation is less than 90% or both, a arterial blood gas should be obtained. And if the arterial PCO2 is greater than or equal to 45, and then this establishes the, that the patient has OHS. Intraoperatively, a regional or local anesthetic should be used uh, if possible, and capnography should be monitored in these patients. Patients with OHS can be very difficult to mass ventilate and intubate. And so the patient should be positioned in the head elevated position, for example, with a true pillow. And nasal oxygen should be applied either low or high flow during laryngoscopy to minimize desaturation during laryngoscopy. As well, video laryngoscopes and difficult airway adjuncts and a skilled assistant should be available to help with intubation as well an awake intubation could be considered in these patients. Intraoperatively, short-acting anesthetic agents should be utilized to ensure that uh, the patient recovers quickly after their surgery. And non-opioid analgesics should be utilized and the dose of opioids should be minimized in these patients, as well minimal doses of neuromuscular blocking agents should be used, and when they are used, they should be monitored and reversed completely prior to extubation. These patients should be maintained in the semi-upright position during emergence and recovery, as well as in the recovery room. Postoperatively, again, non-opioid analgesics should be utilized to minimize the need for opioids after surgery, and positive airway pressure therapy should be resumed as soon as possible and even in the recovery room. And in addition, high, high inspired oxygen levels should be avoided, and um, patients should not receive just oxygen, oxygen, but should also receive their PAP therapy if, ox if supplemental oxygen is given. And this is because the supplemental oxygen, especially at high levels, can worsen hypercapnia and, worse, and uh, lead to respiratory failure. It's particularly important to monitor patients in recovery room to observe them for any observed apneas, pain sedation mismatch, or desaturation. And the patient should be maintained in the non-supine position while they are in the recovery room. The post-op destination depends on the need for opioids as well as coexisting comorbidities, as well as continuous pulse oximetry and ideally transcutaneous CO2 monitoring should be um, uh, utilized if possible. In conclusion, patients with obesity hypoventilation syndrome are at increased risk for morbidity and mortality, and a high index of suspicion for OHS should be maintained, especially when the patient has a very high BMI. These patients can be screened with a screening questionnaire, such as the stop bang questionnaire or, and a serum bicarbonate. And these patients should be referred for optimization of their comorbidities since they are at higher risk for morbidity and mortality. And treatment should be initiated with PAP therapy prior to their surgery. Perioperative precautions should be maintained to avoid complications in this high-risk population. 
with particular attention to the airway, post-operative monitoring, and resumption of PAP therapy. Thank you very much for your attention, and I am um, open to questions during the Q&A session.